Thomas Brocker. Thank you so much for being here. I am super excited to have you answering questions that we receive from patients. Welcome and please, this is, this is your time. Go ahead and tell what you want to say to start this interview. Hey, Saeed. Hey, all of you uh, that are watching. Um, thanks, for, thanks for watching us. Hopefully we will be able to uh, educate you on endometriosis today and, and talk about some things that uh, you know are keeping, up, keeping you up at night and uh, burning questions that you've always wanted answered. And uh, so if this works well, maybe we can uh, keep it going and, and make a series out of it. Uh, we're, we're here to, um, to support the community of patients with endometriosis. And uh, we, we really want to contribute to the, this whole idea of patient advocacy and um, you know, changing the world with respect to um, how endometriosis is treated. So we're doing our part one, one day at a time, uh, one patient at a time. And, and uh, so hopefully you guys uh, get some good information out of this and it's not too boring. Thank you, Dr. Mosbrecher. So I have to tell you, we invited patients to ask some questions specifically from you. So they posted their questions for us to ask from you. So these questions are mostly targeted for you. Some of them might have a general theme but they are meant to be for you. So if, even if they have general theme, we want to hear your opinion and your point of view on those questions. And with that, I'll move into the first question and we start with diagnosis. Um, someone had a laparoscopy with an OBGYN surgeon who said there is no endometriosis based on my laparoscopy procedure. Could that be wrong? This person still has endometriosis symptoms despite that gynecologist telling her you don't have any endometriosis. So absolutely, it could be wrong. First of all, visual diagnosis of endometriosis at the time of surgery is notoriously uh, poorly correlated with disease. So what that means is that they've actually done studies of general gynecologists looking at uh, women's bellies laparoscopically and um, and just by looking, saying, is this endometriosis or is it not? And, uh, and without doing biopsies to confirm the diagnosis, uh, doctors are wrong a good 50, 60% of the time. And, it's, and especially if you have somebody that a, a doctor who mostly does OB, doesn't do a lot of endometriosis, doesn't do a lot of pelvic pain, um, what they are looking for is they are looking for the big black spots or the red spots. They are not looking for subtle little white lesions. They are not looking for what we call cobblestoning, which is where the, the peritoneum has um, almost a pattern to it. Uh, things like this the, and, the, and the small little glandular lesions are actually easier uh, to see on robot uh, on a robot lens because we have the 3D visualization. Now, if you really know what you're doing and you operate on endo, you know you're doing two, three, four hundred cases a year. You can see all these things on 2D laparoscopy. But if you're not used to looking at endo, and especially in in younger patients where their disease is much more subtle, it's a little more atypical, then um, I, I really do believe, and, and we actually wrote a paper that uh, proved this, Dr. Dilemba and uh, a couple other docs and I collaborated uh, to show that, that you can actually see these more subtle lesions better with 3D visualization. Um, but yes, um, the, having somebody tell you that you don't have endometriosis without doing biopsies it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that you don't have endometriosis. On another note, there are a lot of doctors who don't visualize the entire posterior cul-de-sac. All they do is they look at the uterus and the ovaries and they're like, oh yeah, there's nothing here. But they don't really pull the colon out of the cul-de-sac. They don't put people kind of tilted up with their head down and their, and their buns up in the air uh, enough so that all the bowel comes out of the pelvis so that they can see the entire uh, 
posterior pelvic peritoneum. And without doing that, you can't say that somebody doesn't have endo. So if I'm doing a laparoscopy uh, and, I'm, and, and I have a patient who I suspect has endo and I really don't see anything exciting going on, I will find the least little tiny scar or a little white uh, strip or you know things that could be anything and I will biopsy those and I will do several and, and if everything is totally normal um, you know you can even do random biopsies but it's rare that, that there's nothing that looks even a little bit abnormal um, and so you biopsy those and then you talk about it afterwards and um, I have I have had I would say probably a handful of patients in 15 years of, of doing this that truly really have no endometriosis at all, but that's it. Right. That's very interesting. Um, so here's my understanding. So if a, an OBGYN does a laparoscopy, if the lesion doesn't yell that I am an endometriosis being black or red, red typical colors, Mm -hmm. there's a high chance that they won't see a typical presentation of endometriosis, which is really common. The second problem is there are regions, for example, cul-de-sac, that you won't see endometriosis normally unless you really go try to find it there. So that's the other part that OB, general OBGYNs usually miss when there are endometriosis lesions, but they can't find it. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'll move to the next question. And next question is about diagnosis again. And the question is, is it possible to be diagnosed with the incorrect stage of endometriosis? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I have had patients tell me that they have stage four endometriosis and they, um, I, I have no idea how their doctor came to that because they don't have endometriomas and they don't have um, disease on the rectum. And they, you know, they may or may not have a few little adhesions, but nothing major. Um, and so the, it, it, it is very common. And, and then on the flip side, um, uh, I've had doctors not call somebody who did have stage four endo and a completely obliterated cul-de-sac where the, there was a big nodule in the rectum and it was stuck up against the cervix. And they didn't even recognize that that was endometriosis because it didn't have a big black spot on it. And so, um, but you know, since you brought up staging, uh, we, should, we should talk about staging. So most doctors use what's called the ASRM, which is the American Society of Reproductive Medicine uh, staging forms. Um, and these came out, geez, back when I was a toddler, I think, um, I was a resident when, when these forms came out back in the, in the early nineties. And, um, they were created by the infertility docs to predict somebody's chances of fertility. So adhesions played a very large role in, uh, in staging of endo. And it's actually a very complicated uh, system. You have to fill out this piece of paper and um, you not only delineate where the lesions are, but the adhesions and is it a, less than a third of the ovary that's stuck or more than two thirds or you know, between a third and two thirds. And, and uh, it, it's really, it takes probably a good five or 10 minutes to, to fill out these staging forms but nobody uses them anymore. All they do is they look in and they say, oh yeah, this is stage you know, one or two or three or four. And in practicality, um, in, in, my, um, in, in my world, based on the kind of the overall totality of the staging system, the, the way that it was, you, you know, if you take the, you know, if, if you take away all the little details and you, and you just distill it down to the nuts and bolts, basically stage one is superficial peritoneal lesions uh, without any adhesions and without any bowel disease, without endometriomas and without any deep, uh, deeply infiltrating disease. 
Stage two is basically stage one, but with deeply infiltrating lesions. So you have deep disease that penetrates more than five millimeters, typically on the uterosacral ligaments and the sidewalls. That makes it stage two. Stage three is generally thought of to be like endometriomas, uh, that, that they will, uh, and, and the ovaries stuck down to the sidewalls, um, that will get you to stage three. And then stage four is an obliterated cul-de-sac, which generally means either severe endometriosis in the cul-de-sac and the uterosacral ligaments, or more commonly endometriosis on the rectum. Uh, or the sigmoid colon, and then that is stuck to the back of the uterus and, and the cervix. Right. Thank you so much. That was a really good explanation of the staging. I think that's a really confusing um, situation for patients to be. Sick. Well, the other the other thing that's confusing is that the stage does not correlate at all with the amount of pain that people have, and so it's really it, it's very confusing for doctors as well as patients to understand why that is. But the simplest explanation is that pain and disease run in parallel. Not, you know, they're not completely linked to each other. So what that means is that is that the amount of pain that an individual is going to feel is related to their pain sensing system. And everybody has this internal thermostat that you're kind of born with. And it's the easiest way to, to think about it is that um, ever, even, even when kids are kids, I've had um, mothers tell me, oh yeah, this girl, the one with endometriosis and you know really bad pain, um, this girl cried more when she fell down than my other kids. She was sick more. She, you know, she hurt more for any given injury uh, than, than the other kids. And so um, your each individual has, has, a, has a setting in your brain how you're going to process pain. So some people can, can hit their thumb with a hammer or stub their toe and like, oh, big deal you know, carry on with life. Other people um, will stub their toe and want to want to go, go to the hospital and get pain medicine or, you know, put their foot up and put an ice pack on it. And, you know, it's, it's really a big deal. And it's not just that they're trying to get something out of it. It's really what they feel. And so things that influence your pain perception are, um, your genetics and, and just how you were born and what it what it naturally is at. And then there's a lot of other things that can modulate that, that it can increase your sensitization, such as childhood traumas, especially sexual traumas, um, but any kind of stressful situation, anxiety in general, will tend to increase your pain perception. Um, depression, uh, something called catastrophizing, which is where um, you know, the, it feels like the end of the world and, you know, oh, I'm never going to be able to do anything because I hurt so bad. I'm just going to lay in bed all day and die because, you know, the world is coming to an end because I feel so bad. And so all of these things influence your, your pain, um, processing and how much pain you feel for any given stimulus. Now, so that's the, that's the pain perception side of the equation. The other side is how much disease do you have? Where is it? What nerves is it, is it stimulating? And then that's going to drive um, where do you feel that pain and what does that pain feel like? But exactly how much pain you feel is, um, is more because of your, your processing in, in the brain. And so that's why some people can have stage one disease and have 10 out of 10 pain. And then you get these women who are 40 something years old who wind up going to the ER for something completely unrelated, have a CT scan. And it's like, oh, did you know that you had eight centimeter cysts in your ovaries? And they're like, well, yeah, I always had pain with my periods, but I just kind of ignored it. And I had to take care of my kids. And then I had to take care of my parents. And then, you know, they just, you know, life gets in the way. And, and so people with very, uh, very strong or, um, you know, very minimal pain perception 
Uh, so feeling less pain than normal for any given stimulus, they're like, yeah, I just had bad periods and here they are having horrible disease. Right. Sorry, I got kind of off topic, but that more fun way. <laughs> very important, very important, very confusing, totally agree. So this is, so you said, what, what you're saying is pain, uh, stage of endometriosis doesn't correlate with the level of pain that the patient experiences. So it doesn't matter what's your stage, if you have pain, there is, there might be something there. And if you are a stage one and have insane amount of pain, that's, that's, that's normal in endometriosis. It's not like you don't have as severe of endometriosis for this pain. That's exactly. totally understand. All exactly. right. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for answering our questions. This has, this has been great. Now I'm moving to the next section of the question, which is about persistent symptoms and recurrence of endometriosis. And we got many questions in that regard. And the first question was, how should someone deal with endometriosis after a hysterectomy? I know that's a tricky question. I'm all here to hear your answers. Well, hey, Saeed, everybody knows, I'm sure that everybody who is listening to this knows that hysterectomies don't cure endo. Hysterectomies work great for adenomyosis, which is endometriosis of the muscle layer of the uterus. Um, and in fact, a lot of times when we do endometriosis surgery, uh, it is very helpful to take out the uterus in order to get all of the disease out because there, there can be even superficial disease that's on the back sides, <clears throat> really covering over the, the blood vessels and all the big veins draining the uterus. And so that can be very challenging to get uh, endometriosis off of that. It's kind of the junction of the peritoneum with the posterior uterine serosa, if you want to get technical. Um, but uh, just if you have endometriosis and you have a hysterectomy, but they don't take out your endometriosis, well, guess what? You still have endometriosis. And even if they take out your ovaries, you still have endometriosis. And so, um, and, and, and so, that's not going to go away. Endo is not going to go away, even if you have been made menopausal. And the thing that drives me nuts the most, I mean, it really makes the, my blood boil. And I feel like one of those cartoon characters with the smoke coming out of my ears is when I see a young woman in their 20s and even early 30s who's been castrated. Basically, they've had their ovaries and their uterus taken out and their endo hasn't been taken out. Their world changes, their life changes. Um, <clears throat> there, there was a, uh, a study that came out not too long ago um, that showed that risk of dying from all causes, so it doesn't matter if it's being hit by a truck or having a heart attack, your risk of dying increases when your ovaries come out early. And being put back on hormones decreases that somewhat, but it doesn't get you back to baseline. So <clears throat> the question is, how many men would want to have their scrotums cut off, their testicles removed when they're 25 or 30? I guarantee you, none of them would. And so it, it drives me crazy that doctors think, oh, it's just an overeater, it's expendable. Crazy absolutely insane and wrong. Um, removing normal ovaries in a patient with endometriosis, I don't believe should ever happen. There are situations though, when it is, it is prudent to remove an ovary. And, and, and there are some cases where, where you really need to take both of them out in order to fix somebody's pain. Generally, those are in the cases of recurrent endometriomas, where the patient had an endometrioma that was removed uh, previously once or twice or three times. Generally after that, there's not a lot of ovarian tissue remaining. And the, um, it's very difficult to remove the endometrioma and then reconstruct a normal ovary that's going to be functional. And so after several endometrioma removals or ovarian cystectomies for, for endometriomas, then it, it can be appropriate to remove an ovary. But what I was talking about was removing totally normal ovaries to try to minimize endometriosis. So now moving on to post-excision pain. 
Thank you so much. Um, totally agree. This is this is a situation that many patients are dealing with, unfortunately. And like this question really blew my mind. But thank you. Uh, this is great to hear from an expert how this whole thing feels, and from an expert point of view. The next question is: Is post-excision residual pain often nerve pain, especially when the other pain generators are ruled out? So that's really a complicated situation. And it depends on a lot of things. Uh, first and foremost, it depends on the quality of, of, of excision. Now, there are a lot of doctors, not nearly enough, but there are quite a few who say they do excision. And in reviewing um, videos of, of uh, other physicians recently, I, it, it has struck me how how many doctors say they do excision, but yet how much disease they leave behind. And so if, if, if a patient had excision done by uh, somebody who is vetted in our system, who we have watched their videos and we can say, yes, I trust that this person, Dr. Vidali, Dr. Sinervo, uh, you know, whomever else, is vetted and and we have watched enough of their videos that we can say yeah they remove your endo then then we can be confident that yes your endometriosis is gone if you've gone to a doctor who has not been vetted and you continue to have pain similar or the same as your endo pain prior to that surgery then i don't think that we can we can confidently say that your endometriosis is gone <clears throat> In 15 years of doing nothing but endometriosis, I have had probably five or six patients who have had surgery either with me or Dr. Redwine three or four times and have had actual recurrent new endometriosis on those subsequent surgeries. That's five out of 3,000. So it is a pretty small number of patients who really truly have recurrent endometriosis that is not an endometrioma. Now, endometriomas can recur. Uh, they're probably the most likely site of recurrent disease because we don't slice and dice the ovaries uh, to make sure that we see uh, a teeny tiny little endometrioma. So if you've got an endometrioma that's three or four centimeters or, or even bigger, there's a real likelihood that you've got one that is the size of the head of a pin. And we're not gonna see that on ultrasound. We're not gonna see it on uh, at surgery. And so we can remove the one endometrioma completely. And a couple of years later, that little baby one now grows up and becomes a, a bigger endometrioma. So that is, um, endometriomas are probably the most likely site of recurrent disease. But, you know, fortunately we can see those on ultrasound and we can tell what's going on. Um, in, in patients who have had ovarian cystectomies for endometriomas, um, probably what is even more likely than recurrent endometriomas is just scarring of the ovary to the sidewall. And so what happens is that the ovary sticks down to the sidewall and then when every month when you ovulate and it makes a cyst, that pulls on the tissue on the sidewall. And then that causes pain that is typically flared with ovulation. And we can see that too on ultrasound because we can push on the ovary with the ultrasound probe and we can tell how the ovary moves with respect to the, the blood vessels that are underneath it or uh, the bowel that's overlying it, we can, we can see how things move. And if everything's nice and loosey goosey and moves all over the place, then we can be fairly confident that there's not a lot of adhesions. Um, if if uh, we push on the ovary and the uterus and it all moves like a chunk, you know, then one big monolithic block, then that is a, a pretty good, it's not hundred percent because it can be a false positive indicator, but it's a probably an 80, 75, 80% chance that, um, that there's gonna be some significant adhesions and those adhesions can cause pain too. Um, but absent those two things, 
patients that have pain post excision by somebody who really knows what they're doing, 95% of the time, it is a combination of the pelvic floor and the bladder. Um, I do believe that there are cases of uh, something similar to uh, CRPS, which is complex regional pain syndrome, which used to be called um, RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Um, those, those syndromes are kind of like phantom limb pain. I think that's the easiest way for people who aren't really medical to understand what that is. And basically what it is, is that, is that those nerves have been firing for so long they're just firing, 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 firing. And uh, people that have phantom limb pain tend to have had traumatic amputations. Uh, you know, they're in, they're in car wrecks, they get run over by a train, you know, things like that. And the limb gets just mangled and then it gets amputated. And so that stimulation is so strong coming into the spinal cord and into the brain that it, it just persists and those nerves keep firing. Um, even after the disease is removed. That is very rare. Um, I think it's probably less than one or 2% chance of, of having that. I think far and away, the more, the more likely reason that somebody has pain after excision is either adhesions or, um, or pelvic floor uh, spasm. Right. So what I what I learned here, and I, I believe that was the conclusion that if there is a residual pain, there is a higher chance of, as you said, of having some lesions or adhesions, but there is a one or two percent chance, more or less, to have some nerve pain, the pain that has originated from the nerve. Right. Yes. To the same topic. So the next question also uh, touched on the same topic and asks about cryotherapy. So, do you recommend cryotherapy for the pudendal nerve when excision doesn't alleviate the pain? Let's assume that's a top excisionist that has done the excision and there is no lesion there and there is no, um, there is, there is no other pathology there, but the, the pudendal nerve that is involved probably is sending some signal. What do you think cryotherapy helps or, or what helps if, if not cryotherapy? Yeah, you can do cryoablations for pedendal neuralgia. I have a, a, a pain management guy that I work closely with, Dr. Adaman, Jason Adaman, and he does uh, he does uh, steroid injections and, and uh, uh, cryoablations. Um, you use cryo rather than um, hot or radio frequency ablations because there is some motor component to the pedendal nerve and you don't wanna kill that motor component. So by doing the cryo, all you do is, is get the sensory component of it. Um, <clears throat> you can also, I think that there, there are some patients who have spasm of their obturator muscle and the pedendal nerve runs through something called Alcox canal, which is basically the obturator muscle has this little curly cue on the bottom of it uh, of fibers that creates this canal called Alcox canal for the that the pedendal nerve runs in as it's going from the inside of the pelvis down to the perineum. And I think some people can have that that have muscle spasm of the obturator can have impingement, distal impingement of the of the pedendal nerve. And sometimes doing Botox in the obturator will help that. Um, but I think that I, I, I think that you have to, a patient would have to have very specific pedendal neuralgia kind of symptoms rather than recurrent endometriosis symptoms. And they're completely different. All right, thank you so much. Uh, question out of curiosity. Uh, have you talked to Dr. Eisenman? I, I think you said, how, what percentage of your patients that you have sent to them have pudendal neuro neurology versus other reasons of pain that he can help them. I'm just curious, like from your patient's population, what's the situation of pudendal involvement? Adaman, A-T-T-A-M-A-N. Oh, Dr. Like Adaman, okay. Yeah, I, um, I send him patients who have uh, basically um, things that I can't treat. 
So I send him patients with pedental neuralgia. I send him people with sciatica, uh, you know, discogenic pain, um, back facet type, you know, pain. Um, and we also work with a, uh, with a couple of PTs very closely who can deal with pelvic torsion. Um, and then sometimes we'll do injections in the SI joint. Um, sometimes we'll do PRP, which is platelet rich plasma. Um, he does a lot of PRP injections and he uses a technique uh, that's, um, there's a company called Regenex um, that basically what they do is they draw an awful lot of blood and then they concentrate the platelet layer uh, to 20 or 30 or 40 times concentrated. And so his results with PRP are much better than the literature because if you read the literature, most of that is like six times concentrated. And so it really matters uh, how much you spin it down. And he can actually do PRP to the pedemal nerve as well. Um, and uh, something called platelet lysate, which is where they break down the cell membranes of the platelets because the cell membranes can be a little irritating to the nerves. So they basically dive bomb the platelets and break them into a million little parts and then they filter out the cell walls and then they inject that around the nerve. Um, and he actually did that to me once I, I dropped a 60 pound box of tile on my toe and I almost amputated, I dislocated this joint here. And, um, and basically everything from here on down was just on fire because that nerve got damaged. And he injected um, PRP into the joint and then platelet lysate around the nerve. And it, it's amazing how much better that is. And so I really, um, I'm a believer in PRP and I think that it can, it can help a lot of things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great information, great insights. I was personally um, not as informed about how pain management can help, but now I totally understand what you say. Dr. Mosbrocker, the next question is, if pain remains post-excision and other generators are ruled out, at what point will another surgery make sense? Well, when you, when you suspect either um, adhesions or uh, the possibility of recurrent endo, um, I've had patients come back six months after excision and they're like, I'm not better. I want you to operate again. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's way too early to have true recurrent endometriosis. So those six patients, five or six patients that I've had with true recurrent endometriosis, it has been at least 18 months. And most of them, it's somewhere between two and four years when their when their, uh, pain from, from their disease returns. And so um, I think that if, you know, if, if you think that there's a reasonable chance that you're going to find something that you can fix surgically, then it's okay to reoperate. But, you know, you, you have to be judicious because the more times you operate, the more scarring there is to the peritoneum, the more fibrosis there is, which is basically where the, where the tissue scars, and then it gets hard and firm. And then the ureters and the blood vessels and everything that's underneath that per peritoneum in the, in the pelvis gets stuck and it increases the risk of injury. And, um, and so you don't want to do it willy nilly, but on the other hand, if you really think that there's something that, that you can fix, then um, it, it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, that is in contrast with doctors that do ablation that every six months they go in and, and ablate because that's all they have to offer. offer. Uh, and, you know, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so I like to think that I have a, a, a full tool chest uh, with, with multiple tools that either I can op operate or somebody else can, not like surgery operate, but, you know, work. Um, and so... Um, but it, it, it is recurrent pain is, is challenging, um, but it's usually something that we can make better. We can't always make it go away. And that's the thing that I think patients need to understand is there may be a point in your life where you will always have pain. And um, I have a torn labrum in my hip. I think I did it skiing about 15, 16 years ago. And I have just come to the 
conclusion that, you know, if I sit too long, if I do certain things, I'm always going to hurt. But I know how to manage it. I know what it is, and it's not scary. And I think the thing about pain is that if you if you don't understand it and you don't know what makes it worse and what flares it and how to control it, then it becomes more scary. And then when things are uh, when things provoke anxiety, then um, then they hurt hurt more. And so. I think the thing that's really important for patients with recurrent pain is that you have to understand your body and you really have to put the time in. And part of that comes with physical therapy. Part of it comes with, uh, you know, possibly doing some uh, what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, where you where you work on your brain to kind of downregulate the anxiety that comes with the pain so that you can say, OK, I know what this is. And I've dealt with this before. It's not going to kill me. It's not going to put me in the ER. And, you know, I can deal with this. And, um, and that is really helpful. Right. So from, from patient's point of view, um, I know you answered the question from multiple aspects, but I want to be like more specific here, push on, on one point. If I'm a patient and there is a chance that I need another surgery, right? And I have pain, I do multiple things. I do physical therapy, I go to see cognitive behavioral therapy. I have a good diet, good lifestyle to manage the stress inflammation. Still, I have pain after a year and a half or two years. At what, at what point, like if I have done everything and this is two years, are you saying that that's the point that you would reconsider that this might be another lesion that has come up recently? Or like, what's, the, what's that point for you that for me, as a patient, I have to think, okay, from now on, there might be another lesion that I have to go to an expert or to the same expert to do an operation on me. Well, I don't think it's not cut and dried, Saeed. It's not the same for anybody. You know, it's not like, oh, your blood pressure is above this number, therefore we need to treat it. Uh, it's much more nuanced than that, and it's much more of an individual thing. Um, I'm trying to tell you how I think about it and how I approach it. There's no one answer. And it depends on what does the pain feel like? It depends on where is it? And it depends on who the patient is. Um, you know, time from their last surgery plays a role in it, in it. What it, what it feels like, um, what we can find on, on imaging or on ultrasound or on physical exam. And so there's, you know, there's a bunch of different factors that play into that decision. And I can't just tell you hypothetically you know, yeah, two years is the magic mark because it's not that simple. Right. Excellent point. Yes, ex that's excellent. Like this is very individual based. It's, it depends on the surgeon and the approach. Also, it depends on the patient's individual profile. That's a perfect point. I think this is really important to, to be known by patients so they won't expect one single simple answer for that question. All right. Thank you so much. That's great. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next question and the next question is, um, it's about the recurrence of endometriosis. How can post-op recurrence of endometriosis be prevented, especially cul-de-sac endometriosis? Well, first of all, complete excision is the biggest, you know, the, the number one way to prevent recurrence. Um, there have been a lot of studies looking at uh, prevention of recurrence of endometriomas. There's not a lot looking at uh, peritoneal endo recurrence um, because endometriomas are, are easier. You can see them, right? And so they're, they're easier from a scientific study point of view to, to look at. And so there's been a lot of studies looking at uh, do hormones, specifically progesterone, um, prevent recurrence or slow the recurrence of endometriomas. And when you read the literature, the results are all over the map. And the difference is the quality of the excision and how completely was that cyst removed. And so when you, when you remove endometriomas, there's this very delicate balance between let's get all the disease out, but let's not take out too much ovary because you know, you're 25 and you're probably going to want to get pregnant here in the, in the future and you're going to need all those little follicles to ovulate. 
And so <clears throat> it is um, it is a very, um, very delicate balance. And uh, a lot of these studies are done by reproductive endocrinologists rather than endo excision surgeons. And so um, most reproductive endocrinologists in this day and age are not surgeons primarily. They are, uh, they do IVF and they operate when they have to. And, you know, some do more surgery than others and some are, are very good surgeons. I mean, Dr. Vidali is a, a classic case. He's a, he's an RE who's an amazing surgeon, but I would say most probably 90% or more of reproductive endocrinologists are not, don't operate, you know, two or three times a week. You know, they operate maybe two or three times a month. And so volume really matters. It's, uh, you know, it's like Sully Sullenberger, the guy that landed the, the plane in the Hudson River. You know, he had hours and hours and hours and hours in the cockpit and he, he knew what to do. And how much you operate and how many hours over your lifetime you have logged in the OR really matters when it comes to these kinds of skill sets. And so, uh, so it's, it's really hard to look at that data because it's, it doesn't make, it's all over the map. And some studies show that it doesn't matter, which probably means that the endometrioma was resected completely. And other studies show that it does matter, which to me, in my way of thinking about it, probably means that they didn't get the whole thing out. And so it's, um, it's, it's a question to which we don't have a good answer. Right, that's great. And so, so you, you basically say for cold the sac endometriosis, the best, the best strategy is to have a great surgeon that's gonna help probably to prevent the recurrence of endometriosis. But overall, is overall, overall, you can't have. There is no good answer for this question about how to prevent it. Yes, I, I mean cul-de-sac, excluding the bowel, uh, the cul-de-sac is no more likely to recur than any place else. And honestly, say peritoneal disease does not tend to recur. It's very rare. Um, where endometriosis recurs is probably not recurrence, but it was where it was missed in the first place. And so where I find disease the second time I go in is either in the ovary or it's somebody who had stage four disease and it was everywhere. And there was a spot way over in the corner by the round ligament or, you know, up underneath the cecum or, you know, somewhere strange that just got missed. And, um, but as far as the, the cul-de-sac goes, it is not likely to recur. Now, if you're talking rectal endometriosis, um, then the, the risk of recurrence after, and, and this is in the literature, this is not my personal data. In the literature, the risk of recurrence is up to 20% after a discoid resection and 2% after a low anterior resection. My personal recurrence rate is just about zero, I think, after a segmental resection and almost zero after a discoid. And so um, it is very unlikely to recur on the bowel as long as it's treated appropriately. Um, and then the second thing on, on that line, and this is really not something that you asked me, but something that popped into my head, is that not all endometriosis on the bowel is symptomatic. And so um, I operated on a girl last week who I had originally taken care of, I think in 2013. And um, she had no symptoms of intestinal endo. And I got in there and she had all these red spots on her colon. And it was like the entire length of her colon had all these little red spots. And it was like, this kind of looks like endo, but it's, you know, it's not deeply infiltrating. And so she was really, she was like 20 at the time. So I told her mom, I said, I don't think this is going to bother her because she doesn't seem to have symptoms now. But um, if it does, then we'll need to do a, a colon resection. 
And she, uh, she has been good for the last, uh, what is that, um, seven years, eight years, and um, had her kids and now she's bleeding like crazy and her uterus is not being nice to her. So we went in and did a hysterectomy. And um, she, she still had those little spots, but they hadn't grown, they hadn't changed and um, they're not bo bothering her. So case in point. Right, that's that's excellent point. That that case was really excellent that you said. Yeah. Dr. Mossberger, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for answering all these questions. And you know, when I was reading these questions, I thought like these are really thoughtful questions, and it shows how well educated and well informed the endometriosis community and people who have endometriosis have been because. I was really challenged by this question. And I see like these are amazing questions. And when you answer them, you have multiple cases, which shows it, there is no simple answer to them. What was your idea when you were reading these questions? It sounds like my patients who come to see me. Um, I, I have to tell you that I have been very impressed uh, as, as you are with the understanding that most of our patients with endo have about their disease. And um, it's, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't understand, well, I do understand because, um, you know, patients go in to see a doctor and they ask them questions and the doctor doesn't have answers. And, um, and for some reason, instead of saying, you know what, I don't know, I, I can't answer your questions, but I'll find somebody who can. You know, they get defensive and you know, their ego gets in the way and, and things like that. Um, and uh, so, so many of these patients have been treated poorly by the medical community, partly just because of their disease and partly because of their curiosity. And um, I think that uh, Nancy and, and Nancy's Nook and all of the advocacy groups that, that we have nowadays, um, all of the education for women with endometriosis online, uh, we are creating patients who know more about this disease than their doctors do. And it's, um, it's good in a way, but it's very sad in, in, you know, that the doctors don't know more. And, um, I think that the only way that this is gonna change is by the endo advocacy groups really pounding on ACOG and AHL to, um, to change their approach. When, when I was a resident, it was beaten into us that every woman with endometrial cancer, every woman with ovarian cancer went to the GYN oncologist. And, um, you know, back then there were a lot of generalists who would operate on endometrial cancer because most of the time, you know, you take out the uterus, it's stage one, it's, you know, you take out the uterus and you're done and, and, um, and you, you don't need to do a big lymph node dissection. Um, even if you do lymph node, pelvic lymph nodes are easier than endosurgery because, you know, all the tissue is normal. It's not all sclerotic and scarred and hard like a rock and, being stuck together. So there's no reason that generalists who are decent surgeons couldn't do that, but it has been beaten into every gynecologist over the last 30 years, maybe 40 years, that all of their patients with cancer go to the GYN oncologist. I think we need to do the same with endometriosis. I think that if, if a woman has pelvic pain, and uh, their, their generalist wants to do a laparoscopy um, to diagnose it and maybe burn it or do a biopsy, you know, their, their usual standard stuff. Okay, fine, do that, but do it once. Don't do it five times. Don't do it 10 times. Don't take out their uterus and their, and their parts because you don't know how to treat endo. And then for sure, anybody with advanced stage disease, endometriomas, bowel disease, uh, you know, anything else should just automatically go to pelvic pain specialists and endometriosis surgeons. And I think that we need to create that kind of a, uh, just the same as, as with oncologists. 
Um, it's the same now with, with Eurogon. Most general OBGYNs don't touch, they don't do slings, they don't do prolapse repairs. Um, 20 years ago, generalists were doing all that stuff because there weren't many urogynecologists. Now, finally, 20 years after, 25 years after urogyne started as a specialty, they finally made a board for it. And now people can get board certified in, in urogynecology and female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, FPMRS. Um, and I think that we need to make the same push for endometriosis, that it is, it is yes, you can make the diagnosis as a, as a generalist, but once you operate once and they are not fixed and they still have recurrent pain, then they go to a specialist. And I think that part of what we can accomplish with I Care Better is that is that um, you know? Hopefully, one day we can put our data together and we can prove incontrovertibly. Uh, is that a word? <laughs> we, we, without a shadow of a doubt, we can prove that excision works better than ablation, and that it is standard of care for endometriosis. And um, that is that is my goal in life. If I can do one thing in life, that's that with the rest of my life, that's what I want to do. Totally agree. I am 100% on the same page with you, and I hope we can make it happen as soon as possible with the help of amazing surgeons and, and really strong and smart advocates that are supporting this community and very knowledgeable patients. This is amazing. So thank you so much for sharing your ideas and opinions about um, how well-informed these patients and this community has been uh, generally i'll move on to the next question that i received from our community members uh, you touched upon this question in the last question but i'll repeat it here just because this is a more specific question about endometrioma and that's can birth control pills prevent endometriotic cysts recurrence um I don't think that they can probably prevent it. I think they can probably slow the development. So what we know about hormones and endometriosis is that, uh, is that progesterone um, and as well as the GnRH agonist, which is Lupron and Cinerel and Elagalix, which is, what's that, what's it called, the new one? Uh, Orlisa. Orlisa, yeah. So, all of those drugs work equally well to suppress the biological activity of endometriosis. The thing is progesterone, either natural progesterone, in, which is called prometrium, or uh, synthetic progesterone, which is um, uh, norethindrone, which is what I use most of the time, have far less side effects than the GnRH agonists, and they're cheaper. And there's a Cochrane review, which the Cochrane database is, uh, is a company that does review articles of basically they look at, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 articles uh, that have data on any one certain question. And then they pool all that data and then they come up with a, um, with a, with a meta, meta analysis really is what it's called. And they did one looking at progestins versus GnRH agonists. And their conclusion was there's no benefit to GnRH agonists. They all work the same, but the side effects and the risks, which are specifically uh, loss of bone density, loss of memory, uh, uh, chronic pain that people can get from joint pain um, with, the, uh, with the GnRH agonists, you don't get that from progestins. And so they are safer and they are cheaper and they are just as good. So that's my thought on, on uh, those drugs. Going back to birth control pills, which are a combination estrogen and synthetic progestins. Um, I think that just plain progestin with the norethindrone is probably better than birth control because most people don't need the estrogen. Um, and it's the and it's the progestin component that is suppressing the biological activity of endometriosis. It will not get rid of it. It will not cure it. 
and it will not permanently fix it. However, it will slow the progression of the disease probably. So is it if, if, um, if a patient had an endometrioma, they do well on birth control, they can take it continuously so they don't have to have periods, they don't want to get pregnant, and you want to be on birth control, I say go for it. You know, if people are like, yeah, I'm moody and my family hates me and, you know, I, I don't like how I feel when I'm on birth control, no worries, don't take it. Um, but uh, yes, there's a, there's a possibility that it can do that. But again, we need better data because we need to know um, what the quality of the, of the surgery is. Thank you so much for answering the question about birth control pills and endometrioma or endometriosis cysts. The next question is again about recurrence of uh, endometriotic cysts. And if birth control cannot prevent it, or as you said, it slows it down, it doesn't prevent it, what can prevent endometriosis cysts from recurrence? I mean, we only have so many tools. We have surgery, we have hormones, and that's about it, right? Um, to my knowledge, there is no um, herbal thing, you know, like uh, turmeric, curcumin, or fish oil, or, uh, you know, uh, quercetin, or things like that, that will prevent it. Um, and it's basically, uh, you need to do good surgery, and then, um, you know, you can try progestins if you want, or you don't have to, but endometriomas are, are, are a booger. Um, they are probably the, the hardest thing that we have to deal with because intestinal endo, you can just go whack it out, you know, and it doesn't matter if I take six inches or eight inches of your, uh, of your colon, you're going to heal just fine. And, um, and, uh, if we need, you know, if you've got a bigger nodule, we, we take a bigger chunk and we make sure that we have clean edges with no disease on them. And, um, and you're not losing anything by losing that structure because it'll heal up and, and eventually your stools will go back to normal and you'll be fine. Ovaries, you only have so many follicles. You only have so many potential eggs. And so we have to be very careful when we remove endometriomas to stay in the true plane in between the, the cyst wall and then the normal ovary back here. And you have to kind of get in, you have to know how to uh, cut around the area where the endometrioma is penetrating the surface because that's the part that you're not gonna be able to peel off. And so you actually have to make a little incision right around that part on the surface, but then you can get into the plane in between the endometrioma and the rest of the ovary. And if you stay in that plane, then you should be able to get the entire cyst wall out without removing too much normal ovarian tissue. But some women have not just one endometrioma, but they have three or four or five. And that's when it gets really challenging because it's like, okay, there's this little spot. Is that an endometrioma or is it corpus luteum or is it a, you know, what is it and what do we do about it? And then we're taking the big endometrioma out and then there's three or four little guys. And before you know it, it's very easy to be left with not a lot of ovarian tissue. And so it's just, uh, you know, sometimes you're dealt the short straw in life and for women who want to conceive, who have endometriomas, either large solitary ones or multiple endometriomas, it just sucks. And you just pulled the short straw. And there's, there's only so much that we can do. Right. I, uh, and also, I, I, when we are doing some reviews of surgeries, I see there is a difference between someone that exercises the current visible endometrioma versus someone who just, just you know, sucks something out of it and doesn't exercise the whole endometrioma and, or leaves like a part of it. Like, do you have an opinion on at least having a good surgery might delay the recurrence like versus six months, you might have like in four years of recurrence if you have a good surgery. Does that even make a difference? Would you explain a little bit about that please? Absolutely, it makes a difference. It's the biggest, it's the only thing that, it's the only 
thing that we can do that that makes a difference, right, is the quality of, uh, of our surgery. And there have been a lot of studies looking at, uh, at cystectomy, which means taking the cyst wall out completely versus what's called fenestration and ablation. And so what a lot of people will do is they will drain the cyst and then they'll laser the inside. They're, they'll laser the cyst wall or they'll burn it with the, this thing called the argon blaster. Uh, basically, these are all different ways to, um, to burn the endometrioma cyst wall. And they don't work. They have a much higher incidence of recurrence. Um, and, uh, and when you, when you burn the ovary, you actually do a lot more damage to the follicles that are left and you, um, and you really, um, uh, decrease the, what's called the ovarian reserve, which is essentially the functional part of the ovary, the ability to ovulate. And so, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it is improper in my book uh, to, to not excise the entire cyst wall because that, that definitely will lead to an increased risk of recurrence. It's also, there's one more thing I want to say about endometriomas. It's also a problem, in my opinion, to not close the ovary after removing a cyst wall. Because what can happen is that once you take, if you take the cyst out of the ovary, so here's, here's the cyst, here's the ovary. You take the cyst out, you peel the wall out, and you've got this big flat surface of raw ovary that wants to stick to something. Then you've got the fallopian tube hanging down here. And what happens a lot of times is that the ovary will stick to the back of the uterus, but the tube will be buried underneath there. And so by closing the ovary, by taking a suture that dissolves and sewing that ovary back together, then we can decrease uh, or, you know, decrease to the point of, I've never seen it happen in one of my patients, put it that way, the risk of tubal damage from that ovary scarring down on top of the tube um, and basically rendering that tube useless. Um, and so I've seen so many patients have essentially non-functional tubes that we have to remove after they've had endometriomas resected, um, even if the whole entire endometrioma came out, but it, it's more common when they just do the, uh, when they just drain it, you know, and then they don't resect the endometrioma, then that's gonna glom down on top of the fallopian tube and it's gonna make everything worse and, and, it, and it's really gonna damage, have a high risk of damaging the tubes. There is, there is some data that shows you diminish ovarian reserve a teeny tiny bit by closing the ovary. But I think that that, that risk is uh, much smaller than the risk of tubal damage by not closing the ovary and not you know, suspending it and keeping it out of harm's way. Thank you very much. That was a great explanation. So the, the lesson is it's really important who does the surgery in terms of when it recurs and also if or not it's going to recur. So with that, I'll move on to the next question. And the next question is about specifically about eye care better doctors. But since we don't have a data on all of them, probably you can answer for your own practice. And the question is, what's the likelihood of a patient needing more surgery after having a surgery with an eye care better doctor? So as you said, I, I, you know, we don't have data from every doc within the system. Uh, I would say that my personal rate of, of re repeat surgery is probably somewhere around 5% ish for, you know, for persistent pain. Um, maybe a little higher if we include the women that I've done uh, endosurgery with or without a presacral neurectomy who then come back, you know, a few years later and their uterus is causing them problems either with bleeding or persistent uterine pain. Uh, and then we do a hysterectomy, but just purely for recurrent endometriosis, I, I think it's less than 5%. Okay. 
Um, all right, so with that, I'll move on to the next whole section. Um, so we just finished persistence and persistent pain and recurrence of endometriosis. Now, there are some questions about surgery, during surgery and post-op. And the next question is that if a patient has thoracic symptoms, should a thoracic surgeon be present during the excision surgery? So, a, a lot has been made of thoracic disease lately. Um, when I was with Dr. Redwine, he had almost 3,000 patients in his database, and he had roughly somewhere between 25 and 30 patients with diaphragm disease. And that was a very specialty habit, uh, special specialty practice with probably more significant disease than, than most other you know, practices that, that those patients would seek him out and find him. So even, even in that kind of practice, true diaphragmatic endometriosis is rare. Um, thoracic disease, so where the endometriosis is actually on the inside of the diaphragm and on the lung is very rare. And so um, if I have a patient who has um, significant pelvic disease, because almost all patients with diaphragmatic endo have a fairly significant amount of pelvic disease, they don't have just one or two spots. Um, so if somebody comes in and they say, I have pain in my shoulder, but not the joint, so typically diaphragm pain will be on the right side. It will cause pain kind of underneath the shoulder blade and in this part of, of the chest wall, uh, more posterior. Um, if they have symptoms of coughing up blood or a recurrent, uh, what's called catamenial pneumothorax, which is where they basically get air in uh, around their lungs. So their lung collapses. Uh, at the time of their periods, um, then we suspect diaphragm disease. And um, honestly, to this point in my career, I have had probably 15 or 20 patients with true diaphragm endo that we've done full thickness excisions on, and none of them have had uh, disease in their lung. And so, Patients need to realize that this is exceedingly rare. Yes, it does happen. And I know Dr. Sinervo operates with the thoracic surgeon um, on a regular basis. I think that the, just from talking to him, the numbers of patients who actually have um, endometriosis on their lungs and need a portion, portion of their lung cut off and removed is pretty low. And so I think that, you know, once again, it's all about, uh, you know, your patient population and clinical suspicion. Um, there are a lot of patients who are told that they have endo on their diaphragms. And really what they have is they have hemosiderin deposits from a leaky endometrioma. And so endometriomas can leak from time to time and they will get this thick, dark, bloody, fluid in the abdomen. And that will go everywhere. And it will get on the intestines, it will get on the peritoneum, it will get on top of the liver, it will get on the diaphragm. And most gynecologists don't know the difference between those hemosiderin spots and endometriosis. And they see them and they think that it's endometriosis. And so I have had a lot of patients come tell me that they have endo on their diaphragm and really what it is, is, is these hemosiderin spots. And so um, I, I do think that there are some patients who do need to see a thoracic surgeon, um, but I don't think that it is necessary to have a thoracic surgeon on standby, uh, except for in very, 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 very rare situations. Thank you so much. That was a that was a really eye-opening um, description that you just had. Totally understand that. 
Uh, do you just out of curiosity, when you have a patient who has diaphragmatic lesions and you know it from before, do you have a thoracic surgeon by your side or you do it by yourself? And what's the typical in the field? Like if it, it wasn't for you and there's another surgeon, do, do, do they need a thoracic surgeon or a general surgeon is enough or just a gynecologist with enough experience would be enough for that? So if I, if I suspect that somebody has full thickness diaphragm disease, uh, I work with a general surgeon, uh, Dr. Linda Pai, and we have worked together for uh, 11 years now. And um, I have her available um, more so to put in a chest tube if we need to put a chest tube in um, than to actually do the, the procedure. Um, most of the time we, we do the excision of diaphragm laparoscopically. Sometimes we'll flip the robot around and we'll, we'll do it with the robot. Um, <clears throat> but actually excising the endometriosis and, and closing, the, closing the defect is not all that challenging. Um, every once in a while, you'll have somebody with a fairly large area that, that needs a patch. And then I have her help me with that. Uh, and then if they, if they need a chest tube, then I have her put in the chest tube. Um, but, uh, but if it's just superficial disease, uh, I do it by myself. Uh, most of the time we can suck the air out of the lung, uh, by, by using a tiny, it's a, essentially a pediatric, uh, red rubber catheter. And we stick that in through one of the, one of the ports and then stick it up into the lung cavity. And then we suture around that, um, that little catheter. And then we put the end that's outside the patient into a, uh, a, a water, um, a water bath, basically a bucket with water in it. And then we have anesthesia give these big breaths. And so we're pushing the air out and it comes out in the bubbles in this little bucket of water. And then once they get all the air out that they can and they give a really big breath, then I'll pull that catheter out and then I'll pull the suture tight. And there's a little bit of air on the chest X-ray afterwards. Um, and the radiologists get all excited. Um, but uh, the, the vast majority of patients, their oxygen saturations are fine and they're totally asymptomatic and they'll heal up and the air will go away in a, a few weeks. So most of the time they don't need the chest tube, which is really super painful. Nobody likes chest tubes. So we try to avoid them when we can. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's great. So totally understand that your team, just in, in some cases, you might need general surgeon assistance. All right, I'll move on to the next question. And the next question is about adhesions post-excision. And the question is, do you have any tips to prevent adhesions post-excision? Or is the skill of a surgeon enough for prevention of adhesion formation? So what we know about adhesions is that there are several things that predispose to causing them. Uh, number one, far and away, is infection. Uh, number two is persistent bleeding uh, and, and blood left in the, in the belly. Um, and number three is tissue, tissue manipulation. And so um, it's very common in patients who have had open surgery. Back in the day when we used to cut people open and we'd put a big uh, retractor in to hold the wound open, we would take lap pads, which are basically sponges, and we would push the, we would wrap the intestine in a lap and push it up into the upper abdomen. And then we take a couple of rolled uh, laps and kind of push it in there to, to keep it up out of the way, out of the, out of the pelvis. And um, almost, well, I don't, I don't know what percentage, but I will tell you now that I'm doing sacrocopalpexies on women that have had, which is a prolapse repair done robotically, uh, on women who have had open abdominal hysterectomies 20 years ago, which is you know what we used to do back then. Um, many of them have small intestinal adhesions just from the trauma of that lap sponge touching the small bowel. The small bowel is very sensitive. And sometimes you'll, you'll pull the lap off and you'll see these little teeny tiny punctate hemorrhages. 
you know, that are just these little teeny tiny spots of blood. And what that does is it creates that spider web kind of adhesion picture. Um, so basically, um, if you are very careful when you operate, if you have meticulous surgical technique, if you, um, what we do is at the end of the case, we drop the air pressure down to seven. And the reason that we choose seven is because central venous pressure is about five or six. And so the blood that's coming back to the heart in the big veins of the pelvis is gonna have a pressure of about seven or eight or 10. So peripheral venous pressure is higher than central venous pressure. So arterial pressure is your blood pressure that you go when you get your blood pressure taken 120 over 80 or 110 over 60 or whatever, somewhere in there. And so that's the pressure that is in the arteries when the heart beats. Well, there's also pressure in the veins, even though they're a low pressure system, they still have pressure. And so the peripheral veins are probably somewhere in the ballpark of 10 millimeters of mercury. And then once you get to the central veins, the vena cava and everything, it's closer to five or six. So if we're operating at a, with an air pressure of seven, then we should see bleeding from the veins, from the peripheral veins that have a pressure that's higher than seven. And so that's what we want to see because once we take all the ports out and we close people up and they're in recovery, their intra-abdominal pressure is going to go to zero and whatever was going to bleed is going to bleed. Well, we want to see it while we're in there so we can fix it so that they're not going to bleed afterwards. So we do that. We clean everything up really good. And then we uh, oftentimes, especially when there's a large peritoneal dis dissection or a little bit of ooziness, um, we will use something called fibrin glue. And fibrin glue is essentially all of the components of plasma that form a clot with the exception of the platelets. And um, so what that does is it basically acts like Teflon on the surface of the pelvis to stop all that little microscopic bleeding. And, um, and it lessens the risk of, of adhesions going forward. So I think, you know, just really good technique and making sure that there's no persistent bleeding. Um, and then uh, I think that there's, there's advantage to using fiber and glue. Some people will use a slurry of this stuff called seprafilm. There's, there's a lot, there's been a lot of uh, things brought to market that are supposed to prevent adhesions. And, you know, here again, how good is the surgery? You know, how well did they work? Well, you know, did, did somebody do a meatball surgery where, you know, they were bleeding all over the place afterwards? Who knows? So it's, it's hard to interpret the, those data. Um, but I've gone back in on patients that I've used fiber glue on, and um, they, for the most part, have very minimal adhesions. Yep, that's great. Thank you for detailed explanation. And to add to that, is there anything that you would ask your patients to do to prevent adhesions or, or you do your part and patients don't have like any practice or any, any type of activity that they can do afterwards to prevent that adhesion? So I think, I think early activity is important. I think the more you move early on, uh, the, the more your intestines are going to move and the more your insides are going to move. Uh, I also will send patients who have a history of adhesions or who are prone to forming adhesions uh, to a physical therapist who does what's called visceral mobilization. And uh, so these are specially trained physical therapists who basically they dig in on your abdomen. And because of that, we only we start at six weeks post-op uh, because any earlier in the incisions are going to be a little too tender to manipulate your abdominal wall. But but they can work on, uh, on trying to uh, free things up. And, re and really, I think what visceral mode does more than anything is it prevents, it's not going to prevent all adhesions, but it's going to prevent them from sticking down really solidly. And it's going to just create a little bit more motion in between the organs. Um, and it's that motion that, that minimizes the pain. Um, it lets things, lets things move a little bit better. So I've, I've had pretty good luck 
uh, with visceral mobilization. Um, it seems to help, and um, but it's not perfect. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Uh, um, yeah, I believe there are several physical therapies that can do visceral mobilization. That's some extra uh, license or some extra training that they need to have. And we have some of them on eye care whether that they can do visceral mobilization. Um, all right. So with that, I'll move to the next question, which is about fertility. And the question is, can a person get pregnant with endometriosis? Should they treat endometriosis first before they're trying to conceive? So big disclaimer, I am not a fertility specialist. I am not trained as a reproductive endocrinologist. Um, however, I, I do see an awful lot of women with endometriosis and infertility. Um, so my bias being an endosurgeon is yes, I think that endosurgery improves fertility. Um, I think that it is that it is worthwhile for anyone who has had infertility, who's who's tried to conceive, and they also have pelvic pain, to uh, to um, to have a laparoscopy to look for endometriosis, and uh, and remove it. Uh, ironically, it's this is the only thing that I was taught when I was a resident that I still do, which is that if uh, if a couple. Uh, is unable to conceive after uh, a certain period of time, and it's either six months or a year, depending on how old they are, um, then, uh, then doing a lap to look for endometriosis is, is appropriate. Um, I think that with endometriomas, it gets a little more confusing and a little more complicated because the, uh, you know, the infertility docs will uh, tend to want to stimulate the ovaries and harvest the eggs first. Um, I work with a, a group of infertility docs in Seattle that uh, frequently they will, they will send me women with endometriomas and, uh, and they will do the stem cycle and harvest the eggs and then uh, send them to me. We will do the endometriosis surgery. And then once they're healed up from that, then they will do the implantation cycle. Uh, and so uh, but overall, uh, yes, women with endometriosis can get pregnant with or without excision. Um, you know, the pregnancy rates are not zero in women with endometriosis. They're just lower than normal. Um, I've had patients who had stage four endo and were scheduled for surgery and they got pregnant. We had to cancel their surgeries. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, and they, they do probably have a little bit higher rates of miscarriage with, with advanced stage endo, um, just because of the inflammatory uh, nature of the disease. Uh, and I think it's that inflammatory nature that is the cause of infertility in women who have normal tubes and basically stage one, stage two disease. Um, and getting rid of the endometriosis and, and lowering the, the inflammatory um, milieu in the, in the pelvis, I think is helpful. Um, multiple studies of women with stage four endometriosis, uh, after excision show somewhere between 50 and 60% rates of conception, um, either spontaneously or with IVF, um, after surgery. So we, we know that even in the most advanced stage disease, that surgery is, uh, helpful for fertility. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please give us your comments below and let us know what you think and what other questions you might have about endometriosis. See you soon. Uh -huh.